panel for you this morning. Um, I reread the papers again last night to prepare for this, and it's really quite a remarkable combination of uh, very interesting scholarship, uh, most of which is completely new uh, to me. So there's a lot of original scholarship, very interesting scholarship uh, in this panel. So you're in for a treat. Today, the early bird does get the worm. Um, the panel will proceed uh, as follows. So each panelist will present for 20 minutes. Um, and I'll give the panelists a five-minute warning and a two-minute warning. Um, and then at the end, I'll respond to the panelists uh, very briefly to allow time for question and answer. Um, so without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker this morning, uh, Professor Zachary Wright of uh, Northwestern University in Qatar. Uh, Professor Wright is a scholar of uh, Islamic learning in West Africa, and knowledge transmission and history, particularly of the Tijaniya order, particularly of the Fayda Tijaniya, of Sheikh Ibrahim Nyas. Uh, he's published many books on the Tijaniya, <coughs> including many which are for sale uh, out there. I would strongly recommend you uh, take a look at them. Uh, Professor Wright has served as a mentor for me and has encouraged me in my own scholarship, and I'm very grateful to have him here. And uh, so today he will be speaking to us about visionary encounters with the Prophet in the Tijani tradition of West Africa. Thank you. Um, I, I want to begin by thanking you all as well for, for coming out so early in the morning. Thank you uh, especially to um, Harvard University for hosting us, for Professor Usman Khan, who has been a mentor for so many of us, uh, really an exemplar, I think, of, uh, for me personally, of um, the, the potentiality of, of academia. Um, it's one of the reasons that I uh, entered academia in the first place. It's an honor to be among you, Professor Khan. Also to thank my uh, fellow panelists, um, and I hope it's an interesting discussion, uh, especially um, Professor Ola Damini, who has also been a mentor to me. Um, and uh, I, I look forward to hearing more of your work as it develops. Um, there is no doubt, as Professor Khan noted in his uh, keynote address last night, that the Tijaniya, along with other Sufi orders, continues to play a significant role in the proliferation of Islamic learning and identity in Africa, particularly south of the Sahara. If there are roughly 400 million Muslims in Africa, the number of Tijanis alone may constitute as many as 100 million, according to internal estimates. Certainly, Sufi orders are not all-encompassing vehicles of Muslim identity formation. Sufism, as one of the traditional Islamic sciences, ilm and al-ulum, has always been transmitted in productive dialogue with other sciences, such as jurisprudence and theology, Moreover, textual references to the Islamic disciplines must be read in dialogue with lived context to understand the layered meanings of Muslim African identities. The transmission of Sufism, as with Quran learning and jurisprudence, uh, depended on the formation of disposition and character in the living presence of the teacher, not on disembodied texts. And this was the subject of my, of my previously, previous work on the community of Shaykh Rahman Yaz. And further, orbits of Islamic disciplines whether Tijani's Sufism or Maliki jurisprudence drew in, some, uh, drew in some more closely than others. This does not mean, as some have argued, that there are as many Islams as Muslims or as many versions of Sufism as there are Sufis. It does mean, however, that the coded ideals recorded in texts are only a starting point in, understand, in the understanding of Muslim identities in Africa as well as elsewhere. We in the field of Islamic Africa contesting the enduring legacy the enduring colonial legacy of Islam Noir, where African Muslims are supposed to flounder about in the dark recesses of the Islamic periphery, unaware of Islam's textual traditions. We especially are challenged to read, observe, practice, and dialogue with textual reference. With, with textual reference. We must not overlook the importance of text in our field. And despite its popularity, the alleged distinctively African Tijaniya continues to suffer from a lack of serious analysis of primary source material. Academic accounts often describe the Tijaniya as a unique expression of spiritual conceit. Such accounts have the Tijaniya emerging at the margins of Islamic orthodoxy, claiming visionary validation in the absence of real connection to traditional learning, 
concerning itself more with salvation through divine grace than spiritual purification, and infected with a messianic uh, condescension towards other Muslims and Sufis. The Tijaniya is thus passed over as a uniquely African Sufi order, contributing to the, to the implicit heterodoxy of black African Muslims. Fair reading of the Tijaniya's primary sources in dialogue with vibrant 18th century Islamic intellectual production more broadly reveals several important alterations to the above narrative. Shah Mutajani was connected with some of the most prestigious Islamic scholars of his age, attracting many of them as his students in Fez, the so-called Baghdad of the Maghreb. The founding sheikh experienced visionary contacts with the Prophet Muhammad in validation of the widespread notion of the Tariqa Muhammadiyah as taught by 18th century scholars in Arabia, Syria, Egypt, and India, as well as in Morocco in sub-Saharan Africa. And this was the subject of my uh, presentation to the um, uh, African Studies Association conference, which is basically tracing how uh, several of the key elements of the Tariqa Muhammadiyah are present much earlier in sub-Saharan Africa, as reflected in uh, ubiquitous references um, in Tariqa Sudan, and also drawing on the work of H.G. Norris with the Tariqa Mahmudiyya, um, which had an influence directly on Sibad Aziz Dubag in, in Fez. Uh, who was one of the primary uh, uh, articulators of the Tariq of Muhammadiyya phenomenon from the early 18th century. Um, and I think one of the, the, the key interesting pieces for me is to recognize that uh, Muhammad al-Bakri, um, who is the origin for the very famous Tijani prayer, uh, the Salat al-Fatih, who, who allegedly gets it in, a, in an waking encounter in Mecca, he's a very famous Egyptian scholar, uh, he, he's referred to quite regularly in the Timbuktu Chronicles, um, and he's sometimes referred to as the sheikh of the, the scholars of, of, of Timbuktu. Uh, and then there's this sort of relationship with uh, Muhammad al-Bakri as well, um, and of course in, in the origins of the Tijaniya, um, because of this very seminal prayer, which is really the cornerstone of the Tijani practice. Um, the emphasis, so to continue with the alteration of this, of this narrative, the emphasis on divine grace, or fadlillah, was in many ways a culmination of, of a North African emphasis, particularly within the Shazalia, on the path of gratitude, tariqa to shukr, as the best of Sufi dispositions. The Tijaniya was not the first Sufi order to promise paradise to practitioners of its litanies, but let us not forget that the Prophet Muhammad so he said, I promised paradise to any Muslim who said the testimony of faith la ilaha illallah only once. My paper for this conference explores the concept of visionary experience within the Tijaniya, as such experiences are often used to explain the distinctiveness of the Tijaniya by both Tijanis and their detractors. I think the following passage from the Mashahid of Ali Harazm, the closest disciple of Sheikh Tijani, uh, neatly encapsulates the elements of my interjection here. And just to walk you through um, the importance of, of this source and, and sort of my methodology um, in the paper. I'm not going to read the paper directly, but just uh, give a couple of um, uh, reflections. Um, this mashahid is, is a source of um, spiritual experiences. It records um, the experiences of Ali Harazm, who is uh, the, who, who authored the Jawahir Mani, which is the, you know, the pearls of meanings, um, which is the, the primary source for the Tijaniya. But he also had other writings, including uh, letters. And this one other document is a 212-page manuscript that is sort of copied down for Baraka by uh, later scholars. And the, the, the copy that I was looking at was provided to me by uh, Sheikh uh, Tijan Sisi, the imam of, of Medina Bay. Um, and so in, in his father's handwriting. Um, but basically, this is a, a very interesting source which talks about how um, this disciple of Shaykh Ahmad Tijani would have certain spiritual experiences, including, uh, well, most explicitly, the, the encounter with the Prophet, and how there's a, a continuous dialogue. Sometimes the Prophet asks uh, or, or tells Ali Harazm to relate certain things to. Um, uh, Shaykh Ahmad Tijani. Uh, this is reflected with other disciples as well. There's the case of Al Arabi al Dumrawi. The Prophet um, tells him certain poetry and tells him to uh, memorize it and then relate it to Shaykh Ahmad Tijani. Um, and so there are many instances in which 
Um, this is happening among close disciples, and here's this account, really, of, of what this looks like from a disciple perspective. Um, uh, so I, I want to read one of these um, citations um, from, the, from the manuscripts that, I, that I've translated. Uh, and if I have time, perhaps I'll read another one. Um, so uh, this is Ali Harazm, them writing his account to uh, Sheikh Hamad Tijani. Know, my master, that I saw the prophet God's blessing and peace upon him sitting on your right side on the couch. He smiled at you, and his light emerged from his honorable breast and pervaded your whole body and every hair of your head. He said, O oh, Ali, tell your master and your sheikh that he has been complaining for some time about the increasing heat in his body, but I advise him to be patient. I have not revealed to him the truth of the matter, but I will do so now. Say to him, have I not informed you time after time that I do not depart from you for the blink of an eye? And if I do not separate myself from you, and my light is always with me, never separating from me, then my light is the permanent state of your bodily presence, of your that. It will never pass, and it will remain for all eternity. And know that my light is always increasing and ascending, so the heat will always increase due, the, due to the intensity of my light's inhabitation of your bodily presence. Halul nuri bizati. I've changed the pronouns here. Um, so obviously this is you know, a very intriguing passage for me, given my, my previous work on um, the idea of internalization of knowledge in the bodily presence. Um, and I think it speaks very clearly, most obviously, to the idea that um, the articulation of sainthood in the, by the 18th century, uh, most explicitly within the Tijaniya, really has to do with um, the walaya or sainthood as a manifestation um, uh, and internalization of the prophet's living bodily presence. And, and, and this is an, an idea, a doctrine very definitively uh, promulgated by Jadal al-Din al-Suyuti that the prophet is his, his that, that the Rasul is still alive um, beyond the grave, and that the encounter with the Prophet is not a dream. It's, a, it's an actual encounter because um, the devil cannot take his form, according to the Hadith. Um, this is also significant for me, um, uh, kind of sorting through some of the previous academic literature. Um, I don't consider my, you see a, a book of mine out there that's actually my MA thesis, so. Um, it's, it's more of a kind of an introduction. I'm really trying to go back to, to this work in more depth. Um, so uh, previous academic literature, I'm really referring to um, uh, Abu Nasser and al uh published in 1965 and 2007, respectively. Um, the, the latter one in particular talks about how um, uh, the, the saintly authority uh, of the Tijaniya is really articulated um, uh, in contestation with the, 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 the previous saintly authority of other disciples and, and this sort of, this sort of uh, contest between uh, the disciples and their sheikh and then the disciples between themselves. Um, I think these types of accounts uh, demonstrate something very different, um, that this visionary experience is shared between elite disciples and their sheikh, and that articulation of saintly authority is a, a community effort uh, so not only with Harazm, but Adam Rawi and others as well. Um, um, and so these, you know, these sorts of experiences pertain to testimonies of, of, of Al-Tijani's maqam, or a spiritual station, as the so-called Qutb al-Maktoum, or Hidden Pole, or Khatm al-Walaya, Seal of Saints. But, but it also speaks to much more practical matters of, of the found for the foundation of a new tariqa, from deciding where the sheikh would live. In one instance, the sheikh wants to emigrate outside of Fez, and the prophet appears to Ali Haraz and says, tell him to stay in Fez because the Muslims of the East have essentially lost their Islam. Um, uh, into, into the experience of spiritual states, you hear this um, articulation about um, the heat in the, in the body generated from the dhikr. Um, and there are also uh, key uh, azkar or central litanies of the tariqa that uh, emerge from disciples' own experience that are incorporated later on. And just one example very quickly, Ali Harazm is walking through Fez one day and he sees a man uh, being followed around by 14 angels. So he uh, goes to the man's house um, and says, you know, uh, 
And he, well, he actually spe- first he speaks to the angel. He says, why are you following this man around? And the angels say, well, he's always reciting the last two ayahs of Surat al-Tawbah, um, so he goes to the man's house and says, do you, have a, do you have a litany that you're normally practicing? He says, yes, I'm doing seven in the morning and seven uh, in the evening of these last two ayahs of Surah Tawbah. And Ali Harazm says, well, keep doing that. And the interesting thing, of course, is that in the Ahzab al the, the, the collection of litanies of the Jijaniya, you find that um, Shaykh Ahmad Jani himself um, is doing this same um, uh, arrangement whether after this vision or, or, or before, it's not, it's not clear, but there's clearly an interesting dialogue between sheikh and disciple about the core litanies of the, uh, of the Turika. And, and this is something that uh, we can go on and on about. Um, so I'm sort of out of time. Welcome to an RA. Well, it, just, to, just to conclude very quickly, I mean, the idea then, um, I, I think that is, you know, one, one of the ways to explain the allegiance of the Tijaniya sort of moving, or, or the attraction of the Tijaniya moving beyond these um, very problematic understandings of how we um, conceptualize the emergence of the Tijaniya in the late 18th century and why so many black Africans became uh, associated with this order um, is, is not so much to, due to these earlier narratives about, you know, this some sort of messianic impulse um, so much, but it, it has to do with this, um, the, 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 you know, disciples felt that they were actualizing um, a, 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 this Tariqa Muhammadiyya, the idea of, of living in the, the presence of the Prophet Muhammad through this connection with their sheikh. This is something that was widely talked about in the 18th century from India all the way into um, Mali in West Africa. Um, and so this, in many ways, would have been seen as a fulfillment of, of, of something that people had been talking about for the last two centuries, which was about um, how to make sure that your entire spiritual and external practice really aligned uh, and really connected you in a very tangible way to the presence of the Prophet Muhammad. So I just mentioned that this hopefully is a larger book project um, that's, that's been uh, developing for some time now that is looking at, to re-narrate the origins of the Tijaniya in the context of, of the 18th century, um, really inspired in many ways by Khaled uh, Ruwayib, who's here, a professor at Harvard. Mm-hmm. What he's done with the 17th century, I think really needs to be done with the 18th century with particular relevance to Africa, and I really want to use the lens of the Tijaniya to do that. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Zachary, for that uh, wonderful paper. I hope we can get into some more uh, quotes and passages from there, because there are some very interesting stories in there I'd like to investigate further. Uh, next, we have uh, Khaled Esesa, from <coughs> who's a PhD student at the uh, University of Indiana in Bloomington. And he's going to speak to us today about scholars from the Bilad al-Shinrit and their uh, diffusion and role in Islamic scholarship, not only throughout the African world, but also in the Middle East, in the Hejaz. Thank you. <laughs> oh, and yes, he's going to be presenting from... I'm going to present. <laughs> uh, I'd like to thank Professor Khan and uh, Matthew for the invitation. And uh, yeah. uh, so I'm just going to read. Uh, At the very end of the year 1035, the Emir Yahya ibn Ibrahim al-Jadali embarked on a historical journey to perform the pilgrimage Hajj in Mecca that would have a significant impact on the development of Islamic scholarship in Africa and beyond. On his way, the Emir stopped in the city of Qairawan, the present-day Tunisia, and met with a prominent jurist named Abu Imran al-Vasi. Determined to educate his people about the proper understanding of Islam, Ibn, uh, ibn Ibrahim asked Abu Imran to send one of his disciples with him. But the, la- the latter could not find someone amongst his followers who was trustworthy and willing to go with the emir. Abu Imran, however, suggested for Yahya to go to Muhammad Wajaji, al Lamati, from the town of Sijil Masa. Taking Abu Imran's advice, the emir went to Wajaji and told him about his conversation with Abu Imran. Wajaji asked Abu Abdullah ibn Yasin al Jazali, one of his disciples, to accompany the emir. Being schooled in strict Islamic, Maliki legal school or madhab, 
Ibn Yasin wanted to establish a puritanical Muslim society in the Sahara based upon literal interpretation of Sunni orthodoxy. He waged a merciless campaign against any perceived and Islamic practices of the desert people. Lamtuna, Jadara, and Masufa. However, Ibn Yasin's proselytizing effort was met with a strong opposition as the local groups become, became increasingly disappointed with the content of his lessons. In his account about Al-Murabitun dynasty, Al-Bakri, the prominent Islamic geographer who lived in the 11th century Spain wrote that Ibn Yasin lived and remained among Banu Jadala preaching his message until, I quote, they found some contradiction in his judgment. And so a man learned in law whose name was Jawhar arose among them with two of other elders and they deprived Abdullah ibn Yasin of the right to impose his legal opinions and counsel. They took, him from his, from, they, took, they took from him the administration of their public treasure, expelled him, destroyed his house, and looted his possession." End of the quote. As this passage suggests, Ibn Yasin went too far with his strict legalist interpretation of Islam. In his study of fatwa and nawazil of the religious scholars of southern Sahara, who retained in historian Yahya ibn al-Barra, argued that Ibn Yasin fatwa were not entirely in accordance with Maliki jurisprudence. This was especially true in regard to his stance about the mandatory attendance of the five daily prayer in group, al jamaa and his harsh treatment of those members of the community who refused or could not regularly attend the group prayers. It's generally known that Maliki schools strongly recommend Muslims to perform the daily five daily prayers in group, but doesn't make it a religious obligation. Despite these contradictions with the spirit of Maliki madhab, Historical records suggest that Ibn Yasin movement, al murabitun as an ideological Islamic reformist movement had played a prominent role in shaping the development and the expansion of Malikism across Saharan territories. After being expelled from the town, Ibn Yasin established a Ribab in the southwest region of present-day Mauritania, near the Sanhaja River that separated between sub-Saharan African kingdoms and Berber desert nomadic groups. This rebirth marked the beginning of the rebirth of Islamic learning in, the, in southern Sahara. By the end of the 15th century, a vibrant intellectual tradition and Islamic scholarship had developed in the region of Western Sahara, referred to as Bilad Shanqit. In addition to al murabitun movement, the emergence of Sufi order, such as Al-Shadiliya, Al-Tijaniya, and Al-Qadiriya in the 9th, uh, 18th century, played an important role in the rise of Mauritania as a reputable place of Islamic learning that would have a significant impact on the entire continent of Africa. Charles Stewart's publication stand as foundational texts that argued for the quality of Islamic scholarship in this region, reflecting the dynamism and vibrancy of scholars of Bilad Shanqid. In his 1976 article on the influence of Sah Southern Saharan scholars on Bilad Sudan, Seward traced the system of social and economic exchanges in the broader southwestern Saharan region to highlight the role of Shanaqita merchant scholars, the role Shanaqita uh, merchant scholar played, played in promoting Islam across the Saharan desert. While Charles Seward's work has made us aware of the influence that southern Saharan scholars had upon the intellectual life of Bilad Sudan, their presence and intellectual contribution to the development of Islamic scholarship in Bilad and Mashriq so far remain understudied both in the fields of African and Islamic studies. By focusing on the trajectories of four distinguished Saharan scholars, Talb Ahmed ibn Tuwar al-Jannah, Muhammad ibn Mahmoud ibn Tlamid, Ahmed ibn al-Amin al-Shanqiti, Muhammad al-Amin ibn Muhammad al-Mukhtar al-Jakani, this paper attempts to expand the discourse on Southern Saharan scholars' intellectual tradition by emphasizing the significant roles of these four scholars played in the expansion of Islamic learning in the Middle East. At the broader level, it seeks to illustrate how Sahara scholars who traveled to Mecca and Medina in the 19th and 20th centuries to perform al-Hajj, promoted their traditional methods of memorizing the Quran and transmitting Islamic knowledge. At the specific level, this paper suggests that these scholars had succeeded in building intellectual bridges between Arab Muslim world and Africa, which no longer privileged scholars from Arabian Peninsula and as Isla Islamic knowledge gatekeepers, but established Southern Saharan ulama as equal actors in the process 
of knowledge production and transmission in the broader Muslim world. Today, Mauritania is often regarded as the land of Islamic scholarship and literary production. Mauritania religious scholars such as Muhammad al-Mukhtar al-Shanqiti, Muhammad al-Hassan with al dadaw and Abdullah ibn Bayya and others continue to play a major role in, this, in spreading Arabic language and teaching Islam around the world. The trajectory of Abdullah ibn Bayya is particularly significant as the Minister of Islamic Affairs and Education in Maurit Mauritania. Ibn Bayya has succeeded in becoming the Mauritanian religious scholar of his generation, or at least the one acknowledged uh, outside the Mauritania in the Islamic world, Saudi Arabia, for example, as well as in the Western countries, especially in the United States and the United Kingdom. For his seminal scholarship on Viqh uh, al the jurisprudence of minorities, and Islamic legal methodology, usul al-fiqh, as well as for his global peace initiative to save the, the sheep of humanity. In many predominantly Muslim countries, especially in the Middle East, the term shanaqita has become synonymous with the mastery of Arabic poetry and power of memorization. This reputation, however, dates back to the beginning of 18th century when waves of Saharan Islamic scholars from the famous cities of Tishid, Walata, and most importantly, Shanqiti, which is arguably considered to be the seventh holiest city in Islam, reached the Middle East by way of pilgrimage caravans. And these scholars traveled to Mecca. They concentrated, as these scholars traveled to Mecca, they concentrated their efforts in acquiring, teach, uh, acquiring and teaching Islamic knowledge in the cities of Medina, Jeddah, Cairo, and Baghdad, and others. So I'll, I'll, I'll briefly talk about the sources that I'm using to construct this history. Uh, uh, basically, what I'm using these sources are rahalat uh, that were written by these scholars uh, and rahalat uh, these travelogues that are written by these scholars on their way to uh, Al Hijaz. And uh, I used uh, uh, one of the rahalat that I'm using here is written by Muhammad Yahya ibn Al Mukhtar Al Walati, and. This rihla, he reveals his interactions on his way to Al-Hajj, his interactions with kings, interactions with emirs, and his interactions with the people from North Africa and, uh, uh, and, and, and uh, from North Africa in the Maghrib and in, in Egypt. The other also rihla is written by uh, Muhammad um, and he does the same thing. Uh, he, he describes uh, his account the hospitality of the hospitality of the people describes their social manners and the food, so it gives you a very good uh, 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 picture of what these people went through when they were performing the Hajj. Uh, I'll talk briefly about the Al Mahalra as an Islamic institution and define it, which is uh, usually referred to as the nomadic university, and how these scholars transmitted that system of uh, of uh, teaching. That's institution of teaching uh, Islamic scholarship to Al Hijaz, to the places that they, they went to. Teaching and transmitting Islamic knowledge in the Mauritanian society has historically been done through two important institutions Al Mahlara and Al Zawiyah. These two institutions have continued to play a major role in the process of knowledge production in sub Saharan Africa from the pre colonial period through colonialism to the present. The first institution is Al Mahdara, called the Nomadic University by some. Al Mahdara is a unique institution of learning that was locally developed to fit the need of the Saharan desert learners. The term is probably derived from the, the Arabic word Hadara, to attend, or uh, Mahdara, lecture. It's devoted to teaching of Islamic disciplines, including Quran memorization, uh, Quranic exegesis, and the tradition of the Prophet. It, often, it offers also courses related to uh, logic, uh, grammar, uh, rhetorical speech. At the core of this is institution is the idea of mobility and adaptability to the Bedouin society. Given the fact that the Moors were very seasonal people who were constantly on the move to look for water locations. According to Shukri al-Amal, al-Mahdara distinguishes itself from other Islamic institutions of learning that exist in North Africa and the Middle East by its physical location and financial support. To this date, al-Mahdara continues to attract and train Islamic scholars for higher calibers all over the world. It's not worth it, in fact, that the renowned, uh, for example, uh, one of the famous uh, um, scholars, Islamic scholars in, in the United States, uh, 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 
Hamza, Hamza Yusuf was trained in one of those mahadras. He was trained in one of the mahadras in east of Mauritania by uh, uh, a famous uh, Mauritanian scholar called Al Hajj bin Bahfu. Uh, so you, people usually refer to Hamza bin Yusuf when they are talking about the role of mahadra. Uh, so I'll move and talk about uh, the role that these uh, scholars played in the, in the Middle East. By the beginning of the 18th and uh, 18th century, the intellectual production of Saharan religious scholars from West Saharan region reached the Arab East by way of pilgrimage caravan. In various parts of the Arab East, these scholars became known as Shanaqita, referring to uh, the town of Shanqit. People in the past, they used to identify with, not in, ter in a nationalistic sense or nationalistic terms, but they identified from the town they come from. And that, uh, people used to say, uh, or Al-Qayrawani, uh, it's belonging to the towns they come from or the geographical location. And that's why these scholars are known as Shanaqita, Nisbatan ila biliyat shaqit. And were reputed for their Islamic scholarship and literary production. It's important to note the fact that these Western, scholars, uh, these West African scholars during the 15th and 16th century were known under the label Ulama al takrur those who belong, belong to the kingdom of Takrur. Although this identity, as Gilan Lydon has explained, was created by Muslims uh, in the Middle East, the name came to be applied to all people from the West Sahel in Arabic tradition. And I, that's, I just mentioned that. Oh. So as this Saharan scholar began to use the town of Shanqit as a point of departure for their organized pilgrimage caravan and frequently traveled to Mecca and Medina, the phrase Shanqid came to replace Takrur in the Arab East. It was during the period between the 18th and 19th century that the term Bilad Shanqid came to be applied by Ahmed ibn al-Amin al-Shanqidi, the author of Al-Wasil, to all Saharan territories. By the beginning of 18th century, many Shanqid ulama began to migrate and settle in the Arab East. Some of them found home in Al-Hijaz, Mecca and Medina, while others decided to settle in places such as Iraq, Jordan, Egypt, and Turkey. These ulama became agents in, of producing and disseminating, disseminating of West African Islam through the Arab East. And in doing so, they did not only become reputed for their literacy and production of Islamic scholarship, but also built intellectual and theological connections between Africa and the Arab world. In, this, in his book about the history of Shanaqita in Bilad al-Mashriq, Yahya ibn al-Idris, has asserted that Saharan scholars who traveled to Mecca and Medina during the, 18th, the 20th century left an enduring impression on Arab scholars whom they came in contact with. Their power of memorization and mastery of Arabic language and literature were significantly remarkable. He reported that uh, Shanaqita scholars occupied various positions of authority in Saudi Arabia. They were appointed as court judges, government ministers, university professors, governmental political advisors and even elected officials. The example of Muhammad, Muhammad ibn al-Amin ibn Muhammad al-Mukhtar al-Jakari, Shanqiti, famously known as uh, Abu al uh, The most prominent Mauritanian scholar in Saudi Arabia at his time illustrate the extent to which Sahara scholars thrived in their new environment. Muhammad al-Amin spent over 25 years in Saudi Arabia, which allowed him to connect with other Islamic scholars in Hijaz, Medina, and Riyadh. His rihla is, is full with remarks and observations concerning, concerning the remarkable treatment that he had and other members of Shanaqita community received from a Saudi royal family in Saudi Arabia. Another prominent alim from Bilal Shanqid who also helped in creating an atmosphere of respect for Shanaqita in the Middle East is Muhammad bin al-Islami al shanqiti Muhammad was famous for his controversial relationship with several scholars in the Middle East. In his book, Al-Wasiq, Ahmed bin al-Amin shanqiti reported that al-Islami debated with some of the prominent ulama from Hijaz over issues concerning grammar and different areas of Islamic disciplines. He even challenged the quality of of, of Islamic scholarship and judgment of some of the famous scholars in Hijaz, such as Ali al-Watari and Ahmed al-Baranzani, al 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 More significantly, Will Islamid claimed that he deserved the imama or leadership of Maliki scholars in Hijaz due to his credential and knowledge of Islamic scholarship. 
than Sheikh uh, Darraji, Al, Al Maqribi. After his, after his time, Muhammad Mahmoud traveled also to Cairo, where he met with some of the prominent ulama of Jamia Al Azhar Sharif, uh, the Honorable Azhar University in Cairo. Muhammad Mahmoud had engaged in serious debate with some of Al Azhar scholars about issues concerning Arabic grammar. He was appointed also as a teacher of Al Azhar Sharif, and also he visited Istanbul and. Uh, uh, he, he also uh, had a lot of connections with ulamas in, in the Ottoman Empire in Istanbul. Uh, so, uh, so this, uh, so, so uh, how much time do I have? Three minutes. So uh, there are other scholars that I didn't mention, but the, 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 the role, two important uh, uh, um, contributions that that helped them, two important elements that helped the Shanaqita to spread Islamic knowledge. One of the institution of Mahara that I talked about, the other one is the importance of poetry and verse. Because verse was, uh, it's, 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 it's a, an important element that helped people to memorize the Quran, the Hadith, and also it also reflects also a way of uh, this ulama in, in, in Bilal Shanqit, uh, it reflects the lack of uh, uh, people where they didn't have papers to write on. And verse and memorization were very useful element for, to help people memorize uh, Quran and Hadith. So uh, without further ado, that's... All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that uh, very stimulating paper. I look forward to discussion about it um, later. Our next presentation is by uh, Professor Ahmed Shanfi of uh, the University of uh, hum the Humboldt University in Berlin, and he's going to uh, give a presentation for us on uh, the it's a wide-ranging presentation on scholars of African descent in the Hejaz, especially Mecca, and Mecca, and Medina, and their influence there. It's a very interesting paper. It spans a wide range of history and number of topics. Very much look forward to reading it, and I think you will as well. Thank you, Dr. So thank you very much. Thank you, Usman, Matt, and thank you all for having me here. I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, African community and African ulama in Mecca, al Jami and Muhammad Surur Saban, 20th century. So my presentation is made of two parts. In the first part, which I call Africans in Mecca, seen from, from above, I present the biographical itinerary of Muhammad Aman al-Jami and Muhammad Surur al saban two personalities of the elite of the black communities of Mecca. In the second part, with which I name Africans in Mecca seen from below, I present the everyday life in a poor and popular neighborhood where the majority of the African diaspora in Mecca has been living. This is the neighborhood of Shari al-Mansur. Now, Muhammad Aman al-Jami. Sheikh al-Jami was born in 1930 in a small village in the region of Harar in Ethiopia. After finishing his basic education in Islamic studies in his country, he left for Saudi Arabia to continue his studies. He first went to Mecca through Yemen to perform the pilgrimage Hajj. After completing the Hajj in 1949, he began to study at the Al Haram's mosque in Mecca in its various halakat study circles and at the branch of the Madrasa Dar al Hadith in Mecca. Dar al Hadith is a, a Salafi movement from South Asia. He then went to Riyadh, where he became student and later teacher in the Mahad Riyadh al Ilmi. In Riyadh, he moved closer to the Grand Mufti of the time, Sheikh Muhammad bin Ibrahim, and his successor, Ibn Baz. 
After completing his studies in Mahad al-Riyad al-Almi in Islamic law, also in the Dar al in Cairo, and then in the University of Punjab in Pakistan, Al-Jami became an official teacher in the state system in different secondary schools. He was then appointed professor in the Islamic University of Medina, where he became later the first director of the Faculty of, Science, of Sciences of Hadith, Ulum al-Hadith. The name of Sheikh Muhammad al-Jami and al-Jamiya movement the Salafi current he represented by reference to his name, became more present in the media and discussions in Saudi Arabia since the first Gulf War from August 1990 to February 1991. Sheikh Al-Jami and his followers such as Rabi al-Madkhali and Mukbil bin Hadi al wadiya a Yemenite, and others launched their offensive against the Sahwa Islamic movement in public space to defend the Saudi government, the royal family, the council of higher ulama, and the decision they were taking, particularly the presence of US forces on the Saudi territory. One argument that had been put forward by the followers of Al-Jami was the hadith of the prophet according to which it is prohibited to rise up against the, the ruler, Al-Khuruj al-Hakim, unless he has professed or practiced impiety openly and publicly, kufrun bawah. This loyalty to the political power and the attachment to the status quo of law and order advocated by Sheikh al-Jami is the same defended long before him by Saudi Salafi ulama originated from West Africa who were, by the way, teachers of al-Jami, such as Abdurrahman al-Ifriqi from Mali, Muhammad al-Amin al-Shinkhiti from Mauritania. All were followers of the Ahlul Hadith the Salafi movement, and all come first to perform the Hajj in Mecca and Medina. Apart from al-Jami, Mecca and the Hijaz had seen in the 20th century famous people from the black community of Mecca. One of them was Muhammad Surur al-Subban, prominent Saudi of slave ancestors. He was the most prominent among the Hijaz elite of his time. His contribution was outstanding, both in civil society activities as well as in those of the nascent Saudi state. He had stimulated the literary production by encouraging writers and by creating the first publishing house in the country. He was a man of letters and philanthropist for the literature production, a rich businessman, and a politician. He was the first minister of economy and finance of Saudi Arabia and the first Secretary General of the World Islamic League, Rabit al-Alam al-Islami, of which he was a founding member in 1962. In the cultural and social domain activities, he began with editing and publishing by his personal expenses, classic books in Islam. He founded in 1935 the Sharikat al-Arabiya Littobon wa Nashr, Arabic House for Editing and Publishing. He is also the author of three books in which he summarizes the ideas and literary trends of new generations of writers in Saudi Arabia. 
what it can be said about his pioneering work on cultural aspect can be also said about his action in social, the politics, and the economy. He founded in 1934 the Foundation of Relief and Charity, Jamai al Isaf al Khairi, a charitable social organization whose central activity was medical care provided to the needy. Regarding economic development, he founded several companies, some belonging to him and his family, and others to the state. These companies included the following, Al-Sharikat Al-Arabiya Lit-Tawfir wal Iktisad, the company of economy and saving, Al-Sharikat Al-Arabiya Lit-Swadirat and Export and Export Company, Sharikat Milh wa Kahraba Jazan, the company of salt and electricity of Jazan, a city and region in the south of Saudi Arabia. Now, African in Mecca seen from below. Although the presence of the African diaspora in the Hijaz goes back to the advent of Islam, the African diaspora of 19 and 20 centuries has been made up by remained Hujaj pilgrims and their descendants on the one side and on the other side by former slaves, which, however, represent the minority among the African diaspora of Mecca. Since at least the 19th century, till the beginnings of the 1970s, i.e. before the wealth that the country had experienced after the exceptional rise in oil prices, before this period, the majority of Africans lived in the Misfala neighborhood and in general in the southern part of the city. That is the Misfala neighborhood. Oh, second. Burkar, Hurgronje, and Richard Barton, the three well-known Westerners who visited Mecca in the 19th century, mentioned several times in their books the presence of the black African communities in Mecca. The black people of Mecca and of Saudi Arabia as a whole are made by one people from West Africa and are known by the name of Takara or Takarira or Takarna, singular Takrur, two by the descendant of African slaves called Mualladun, literally the natives of the country, three by those who came from the Horn of Africa and known as Ahbash. Until the early 1970s, the material situation of the black population of Mecca did not differ much from that of the other categories of the population of Mecca. But from these years, while the economic situation of the other populations in Saudi Arabia was improving in unprecedented manner, that of the African populations stagnated. In many of my discussions with black Africans of Mecca, they complained of discrimination, racism, and marginalization of which they have been the object from the Meccan Arabs and especially from the political authorities of the city. Some say that this phenomenon has worsened since the period of Tafra, literally the time of the economic boom. Zaman Tafra or Ahd Tafra is the expression that Saudi used to describe the period 
which followed the unprecedented, unprecedented increase of oil and at the beginning of the 1970s and the unprecedented will that Saudi Arabia, state and population, had begun to gather. It was curiously from this period also that many of the black Africans of Mecca and the Hijaz had started losing their purchasing power. The place which shows in all its aspect the life of the Africans of Mecca today is the neighborhood or the ghetto of Shari al-Mansur. Critic, rumors, and insult on the Africans of Mecca that have been propagated especially on this neighborhood. Despite the fact that Africans of Mecca lived for centuries in different districts of the city, they came to settle around the street Shari al Mansur since 50 years ago till they became the majority community in this district. On this street, one can find the, large, the largest African market of Mecca called by African Souk Dukankira. This is a daily life in the Souk Dukankira. The critic of African named this market Souk Al Haramiya, <laughs> thieves market, thus implying that items sold in this market have been stolen. The Ramadan and Hajj period are the two major exceptional periods in which the market is daily filled by people whose majority are Africans. The rest of the year, the market is more crowded on Friday by Africans and members of the other communities of Mecca. People sell everything in this market, food products, electronic products, building material, car parts, fabrics, African and Saudi clothes, etc. Over time, this market has become the largest market of Mecca. But because that the majority of people who frequent this market are black of African origin, countless rumors about acts outside the law allegedly committed by Africans in this market have been circulated. Conclusion. Within all of this black population, which are predominantly very poor and very marginalized, we can find a small elite that has miraculously succeeded. The two personalities presented above are part of them, but they are part of a generation who lived during the first half of the 20th century. From this period onward, corresponding to the beginnings of the regime of the Ali Saud, black people disappear from all almost social, political, economical, and cultural responsibilities, except in football. You see <laughs> the team of 2000, the team of 2016. Until the early 1970s, the material situations of these populations didn't differ much from that of the other categories of the population of Mecca. But from this period, called by the Saudi the period of abundance, Zaman Tofra, the standard of living of the black populations remained stagnant, while that of the other populations rose every day, thanks to the petrol money which black population could not have access. Thus, it can be said that the black population of Mecca and of all Saudi Arabia are the ones left behind by the Al-Saud regime. 
But despite all that, the African of Mecca still love, still love Mecca as the books of Abdullah Abkar, the young authors, as the book of Abdullah Abkar shows that. That's the cover of one book of him named Sad al Ayyam Mada Fi Harat Mecca, Echo of the Past, What Do We Find in the Neighborhood of Mecca, 512 page. Suwarum min turasi makatin mukarama, tom one. Uh, some aspect of the heritage of Mecca in the 14th Hijri, 544 page. Tom two. Turatho makal mukarama, suwarum min turatho makal mukarama, 664 page. Asuhba wal Mushahat al Andalusia fi Makkal Mukarrama, the ritual of performing the Andalus Mushahat in Mecca, presentation and analysis, 668 page. From the perspective of the African studies and the topic of the pilgrimage to Mecca, I tried to show one that one of the legacy of the Hajj has been the formation of an important African diaspora. Two, to show the past and the present of this diaspora by showing their life before and after the installation of the al Saud regime. Three, to show how these African communities are perceived by others. From the perspective of the Islamic studies, I try to show through the example of Al Jami the support that the Salafi ulama of African origins have always provided to the Saudi power against their opponent, especially the other ulama like those of the Sahwa, current, and the Muslim Brotherhood. Now I will stop here with a rap song, which also shows the attachment of African to their city, Mecca. I think I will manage. The song is Mecca Haggana. Bakka belongs to us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, to all of the panelists, especially our last four that kind of dropped the mic and to the, <laughs> and to the session. Um, so now I'm going to briefly um, try to respond to the panelists' papers and draw some common themes. I'll try to keep my comments very brief to allow time for uh, questions and answers. So although these uh, four papers covered a wide range of uh, topics, eras uh, and areas uh, from the African continent to the Hejaz, there were a few uh, common themes uh, and important uh, concerns 
that I noticed. Perhaps the most important of these was a, a reorientation of the ways in which we think about the categories of African and Islamic and the relationship between the two, which is one of the uh, goals of this conference and Professor Khan's and the work of many of us uh, here today. But uh, this goes kind of beyond just the relationship between African Muslims, Muslims in Africa, so on and so forth, but a reconsideration of the categories in which we use to think and interrogate uh, African Muslims, mm -hmm. Islam in Africa, Muslim Africans, and, and their relationship. So in um, Professor Wright's and Professor Kubara's paper, uh, we had uh, discussions of the problematic ways in which uh, things that have that are now considered to be part of the occult, the visionary, the mystical, uh, were categorized, thought of in very different ways by the people practicing them, by the discourses in which they were embedded. So the mystical and the rational is a separation that's local, that happened as a particular history with it. That history is not shared um, by everyone in the is Islamic world. Um, particularly not by those uh, authors we were discussing in question. These authors uh, and the people um, uh, who, who were discussed here all have, whether implicitly or explicitly, uh, their own uh, epistemologies, metaphysics, worldviews, through which they structured and organized their thoughts, their social relationships, so on and so forth. But we as scholars also have Anytime we choose a theory or methodology that we use to interrogate or study, we also have uh, philosophical assumptions, uh, a metaphysics, uh, a cosmology. So, for example, if we take a history, we're giving a history of anything. A history implies a cosmology, an idea of what space and time is, which implies a metaphysics of what's real and what's not real and the, the nature of being. When we have... Uh, uh, use a theory or methodology whose fundamental assumptions of cosmology or metaphysics differ greatly from those of the subjects that were being studied, we run into all kinds of problems, as can be seen by the, uh, ec the uh, marginalization of figures like Al-Kashnawi and his works. Also, one thinks of Ahmed al-Buni, whose works are printed all over, not just in West Africa, but all over the Islamic world. You can get them for 30 cents in any market. Uh, anywhere, but uh, only recently, I think Noah Gardner has come up with a very good study of his. But other than that, academia has ignored him because he's classified as a cult. Because the um, the understandings of uh, what science is, what knowledge is, how it's acquired, how it works, uh, that are, are underlie the form the foundation <coughs> of the theories and the dominant theories and methodology in the academy don't match up in very problematic ways with those of Ahmed al-Buni and the people who buy and use his, his works. Um, this was also present in Zachary Wright's discussion of visionary encounters uh, with the prophet. How does a historian deal with this, with the visionary? You're, you're describing the history of the Tijaniya. There are these in interventions, uh, in some cases daily or maybe even constantly, of the person, which is how I translate that, not as bodily presence, but as person or self of the prophet. So it's, it's a part of the history of the Tijaniya, but it's a history, the, the cosmology, Tijani cosmology, is one in which space and time are folded up and interact, and there's, there's a vertical dimension to history. Literally, space is folded up. There's one of the great stories in your papers, Ali Tamasini uh, loved to teleport himself in things, places. The Arabic phrase for that is tile art, literally folding of the earth. Mm. So he would send dates from his uh, farm in uh, Algeria to Sheikh Ahmed Tijani in Fez by doing this kind of folding of, of, of space. So how as a historian, as a scholar, do you then deal with uh, traditions that have a radically different conception of history, of space, of time, of personhood? Uh, these uh, Tijani doctrine and practice evolved through a set of social relationships, but metaphysical social relationships, in which we have people appearing to other people in visions, in dreams, and these uh, embedded social relationships are not, uh, usually if you're a historian, you look, okay, what are the dates of these people? Could they possibly have met? The, these, these kinds of things uh, don't work. And uh, as scholars, not just of uh, Islam in Africa, but really of Islam or any uh, non-modern Western tradition, even of some modern Western traditions, we need to um, be careful which theories and methodologies we use. Um, and be creative and coming up with hopefully new and better ways of engaging with these traditions. These concerns were not absent from uh, the papers of uh, 
Khaled Esesa and Dr. Shanfi as well too, which gave us, uh, Dr. Shanfi's paper gave us uh, a view of the uh, prominent, well-regarded scholars of African descent um, in, in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. Um, but in, in his paper, very interestingly, he gave us, especially with regards to Muhammad Ajami, his, uh, Muhammad Ajami's view of Islamic history. His view, and in, in this, for example, he referred to Uthman Danfodio as a Salafi. Mm. So he clearly had his own, Uthman Danfodio, for those who don't know, major reformer in northern Nigeria, big Qadari Sheikh, also had several visionary encounters with, with, with the Prophet. Um, I, he's not someone, it, it's a big stretch for someone like me to consider Uthman Danfodio a Salafi, but this is how Sheikh Ajami understood uh, Uthman Danfodio. And this paper is remarkable because you get a real sense into the worldview of someone like Sheikh Ajami, which is very different from uh, my own understanding of history. Uh, and then uh, from in the tradition from below, we got a view, and this really cracked me up, of uh, the stereotypes about the Africans, especially the Nigerians. And it seems like we Nigerians have the same stereotypes everywhere, South Africa, China. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, yeah they, we sell stolen things that fall off of trucks and we do magic and we <laughs> chop people's hands off and all kinds of other things. We're dangerous and deadly, so be nice. Um, but th so this, this was giving us a view of the uh, uh, kind of inside a view of the uh, uh, Saudi public. Or I, you took this from a web forum, I think, uh, yeah. a message board of the uh, Saudi public's view uh, which is conditioned by their own uh, worldviews and ideas about race and class and, and, and all of these other things. Uh, what I would really have loved to have seen as well is uh, uh, perhaps a response to this. I don't know if any of the Africans uh, who lived in uh, Masfala or Shari Mansur have responded on this web form to this or if there's a possible ethnographic component that could come in to see, get a better sense of how they understand their place, which I think you somewhat did with the, uh, with the video you showed on, on YouTube, but that, that would be an interesting uh, further thing. Furthermore, in uh, Khalid's paper, we saw the, uh, the importance and the role of scholars from Bilad al-Shinqit, uh, and this leads us to a reorientation of uh, the role of scholars from the far west uh, given their importance in uh, the Islamic heartlands. So rather than be seen as kind of a backwater or periphery, uh, having the center periphery model, we have scholars and learning crisscrossing uh, from the so-called periphery of the far west of Bilad al-Shinqit to the center, central heartlands of uh, the Hijaz and now the Khalij. One thing that might be interesting for you to look into further uh, is the um, uh, Emirates mass importation of scholars from uh, Mauritania, mm -hmm. um, because the Emirates are, uh, by some interesting historical accidents, are Maliki. So they import most of their fuqaha from Mauritania. Um, you can even get Mauritanian food and buy Mauritanian tea sets in Abu Dhabi. Um, so th this is an interesting contemporary phenomenon, which I think deserves further uh, further uh, research. Um, for uh, Professor Gubara's one wonderful paper, I would also wanted to recommend the work of Matthew Melvin Kushki. I know oh, him. you know him? OK, yes. very well. So his, his work on uh, the relationships between uh, the occult sciences and, other science, and the other sciences in the Islamic world, yeah. as well as connections to similar things that were going on during the Renaissance, yes. is really quite remarkable. And I saw echoes of it throughout your whole paper. Yeah. So I'm glad you know him and you're, you're, aware, of, you. you're aware of his work. Um, and then finally, for um, Professor Wright, uh, I really appreciated the uh, inclusion of new sources, most of which are very difficult, if not impossible, for the rest of us to, to get access to, particularly the mashahid of Ali Harazim. Um, and I would uh, not necessarily recommend, but like, like to see a greater fleshing out of the, uh, the kind of uh, psychology, anthropology, um, epistemology uh, assumed by these encounters. There was one uh, passage in here where you said that the Prophet Musa appeared to, I forget it was Sheikh Mintijani or Ali Harazm, in the form of the Prophet Muhammad. <coughs> what does that mean for the, uh, is, is that a, a, an illustration of the fire of knowledge from the uh, so the kind of explanation of these, there are these visionary counters and they're really cool and they're funny and they're, they're sometimes and, and, and they're great to read. 
but I would uh, appreciate a deeper exploration of what are the consequences of these encounters for the understanding of uh, Tijani psychology. What does it mean if the prophet is inside of you all of the time, if his light is a part of <coughs> integrated into your body? If anthropology, what does that mean about what human beings, who human beings are? Uh, epistemology, knowledge transmission, uh, metaphysics, etc. cetera. What, what is a body? A body is, is a different thing in this context than what, what you would learn at the medical school uh, down the street. Um, so overall, I found this, this panel to be incredibly stimulating. Um, I hope you did as well, and I look forward to your uh, questions. And I think we will take, um, uh, because of time, I think we'll take two questions at a time and then give answers and then keep going like that until we run out of time. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. So questions, if you could uh, briefly say, state your name and who your question is for. Yeah, so we have one question here and then one there. They didn't right. know to, right? What's that? Stagnant. What's that? Stagnant. Yes. For the but, that, but that Africans being marked as a particular kind of economic category is something that has a very particular history. So I, I'm curious uh, to know what other kinds of geographies are circulating in both of your contexts, both you, Dalia, in the, in the historical context, and you, Ahmed, in the more recent context, what other kinds of geographies, whether it be these, these rap singers that you're uh, referring to or pre-1970 versus post-1970. Um, if we're going to be thinking about kind of this, this term that's bringing us together in this room, this mm -hmm. African term, uh, and perhaps its, its lack of fit in certain uh, places, what other kinds of geographies might we think about? Thank you. Sure. Thanks for the question, Noah. <laughs> I mean, uh, I think as, as you mentioned in your paper, Khalid, the geographies or the nisbas, because you can only go by the yeah. nisbas, right, that are given, tend to be very local. Yeah. So they're related to specific towns. Um, in, in my dissertation, I actually discussed this a lot in a chapter called Searching for Africans in a Jabarti, which precisely tackles the question you raised. Um, and what's interesting about these nisbas is that they're not always, um, they're often self-imposed as well, or, or self-determined. Uh, and so there's this very interesting contradiction even within this space. You can get somebody who's a Rumi al-Habashi. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what do you do with somebody like that? So in that sense, I, I would say geography here has got nothing to do with actual embodied identities yeah. whatsoever, at least in, in, in the stuff I look at. Yeah. Um, so al kashnawi identifies as a Darankawi, which could link him to Danranko, a town in, in Katsina, or Elsewhere. Yeah. Uh, so relating to the Nisba, also in Saudi, there is, uh, uh, as I mentioned, two uh, category of, uh, of the black African or black descendant. Uh, the, those who have uh, slavery descendant, you can recon uh, recognize them by the name. Uh, uh, for example, Al Talbani, Al Harbi. Uh, those who are not from slave descendants who come as hujaj or descendant of hujaj 
have a nisbah from uh, the region where they come from. Uh, uh, Al-Hausawi, uh, al Fallati, or Al-Burnawi, uh, but, or al -Friti, but these names often were given to them. But at the end, they took the name and identified themselves on this name. Uh, relating to uh, uh, the reason why they didn't benefit to this uh, 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 wealth of, from the petrol, uh, there is uh, many reasons we can uh, speculate. Uh, we can speculate. We don't have uh, a very precise reason, but there is a constatation. Uh, there is a fact. So you see they are marginal. You see, they don't have access to the, the, the wheel. They don't have access to, uh, yes, uh, uh, for me, uh, the, the, the reason uh, relating to race and prejudice to race is a one of the reason. So, but uh, it could be there is another reason. But uh, the fact is there, so. Yes, I would just wanted to quickly, uh, before I take the two questions, uh, I really appreciate your points about the exo uh, exogenous nature of the category Africa, which though is structuring uh, the fields in which many of us teach and which has uh, gathered, uh, gathered us here. I usually tell all my students, my great grandfather had never thought of himself as an African. Um, and uh, this is, I think, speaks to the larger issue that was brought up in many of these, uh, all of the papers on this panel, the problems of imposing or importing exogenous categories into uh, discourses where, uh, where they don't either belong or they're, they're, they're not from, and leads to all kinds of problematics. Whether it's anachronistic or from a different discourse or a different culture, um, it's something we have to be very careful about as scholars and, and deal with uh, carefully. So all right, we have one question here, and then I think I said, yeah, Moro. Uh, right, um, in Mauritania, it's a very highly uh, stratified society, and you have, uh, and I should have said something about this at the beginning, you have the Arabs, and you have Berbers, and you have other Sahelian groups that include Wallaf, uh, Soninki, and uh, Pula, um, the Halpula. And 
the shanaqit or the term uh, is used to refer to one group. Uh, within the Arab Berber groups, you have the warriors and you have the clerics, the zawaya that are specialized in knowledge, Islamic scholarship. And the term shanaqada, when it's used, it's used to refer to this group, to this zawaya. Even that's, that's problematic uh, to me because scholars, uh, uh, Mauritanian scholars who were uh, uh, specialized in Islamic knowledge were not only limited to the zawaya, even those who we call the warriors, uh, Bani Hassan, they were, some of them were specialized in Islamic scholarship. But to go back to your question, in, in, in Al-Hijaz, in, in, and this is still today, this goes back to the beginning of this migration, this Hijra to Al-Hijaz. Uh, they refer, the term actually that they used to use past uh, to refer to uh, um, the was Takrur, mm -hmm. and that was associated to the kingdom of Takrur. But Al-Wasir, in Ahmed ibn al-Amin al-Shanqita, in his book, Al-Wasir is the one who uses the term Shanaqita. And he uses it to make a distinction between uh, the Sahelian groups mm -hmm. and the Arabs. But because this is, the, this is the, in, in, in Al-Hijaz, people they view this Shanaqita not as Arabs, because they are coming from the peripheries, and they were treated as, uh, even they claim they are Arabs, this Shanaqita, but they are, in Hijaz, they see them as Africans, not Arabs. And it was said, uh, Ahmed al-Amin al in his book, was said, what he tried to do, he tried to prove himself as uh, an Arab and to prove himself as someone who is not being identified with the Tukrur. So he's trying to isolate. So it's, 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 a, it's a problem of identity. Uh, but again, uh, when they refer to Shanaqita, they usually refer to the Zawaya who come from Shanqit, now mm -hmm. the city of Shanqit. It's interesting because al Bakuli, that's like a century before, actually, Takrur, uh, I think, might be wrong, also for the uh, Berber. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's very you know, fluid category yeah. going back yes. to this idea of activating the identity. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Yeah, um, I think what's important as well is the historical dimension, right? Because we cannot um, under understate ever the importance of the huge epistemic ruptures that happened from the 19th century and especially with colonialism on the continent afterwards. Um, so what is true perhaps for, for your um, subjects in your paper is not necessarily the case for somebody in the early 18th century such as El Kashnawi. Now in terms of... Um, sort of identities, as you were saying. Did these people feel a certain way or whatever? With al Kashnawi, we were actually very lucky because in the extended prolegomena of the Dur, he has this autobiographical kind of section. And in it, and specifically on, on page four, I just dug up the quote here. He says, so when he arrives in Mecca, he is introduced by a guy from uh, Kanem to a uh, Meccan notable by the name of Duhaydah, Al-Duhaydah. And Al-Duhaydah knew that there was a scholar in town who knew something about magic and he was very interested in studying with him. And Kashnawi says, I was suspicious of him, of Al-Duhaydah, because I find that in most cases in these lands, they don't like anyone, especially if he be of our people, the Sudanese. Okay? He says, لا يحبون أحدا خصوصا من يكون من جنسنا السودانيين. Yeah? except where they seek to benefit from him, but without any real affection or true care. And when they attain what they want from him, they abandon him, and he becomes to them like a thing discarded, and malqa, as though they never knew him or befriended him. Now, scholars have been tempted to read this as some kind of expression on Kashnawi's part of his racial alienation from the Arab heartland on account of being Sudani, quote unquote, and because he, refer he uses this term jins. But if you start to do the genealogical work on the term jins, you realize that jins here has no, no racial connotation to begin with, and is actually a, a very shifting idea of how you belong. Right? I mean, it's, it's uh, people like Joseph Mazad have worked mm -hmm. on it extensively. Um, so uh, Stefan Reichmut and others argue that this is, this is proof Right, that Al Kashnawi was alienated and so on and so forth. And actually, in in my paper, I start to argue that this has nothing to do with um, with race and is actually about a certain sense of alienation that a mujawir 
one who is in a process of, of being a pilgrim in the, in the central lands, would feel anyway. It's the condition of Mujawada writ large, right? The sense of alienation, a sense of exile from one's homeland. But what is longed for is not a geographical or a physical homeland, but rather a sort of a spiritual homeland. And if Kashnawi then goes on, and I mean, I won't read you more from the paper, but he goes on to quote lines of poetry that actually uh, emphasize this. Um, so yes. The estrangement is there, but it is not a racial and definitely not a geo. Identity, yeah, but not a it is not, yeah, it's not a geo uh, racial identity, definitely not. All right, so we will take two more questions, Professor Cressy, and then I think I saw your hand. Okay, let's, let's, let's finish with uh, four questions. We'll finish on a big note one, two, and three, and four. Then there was one, qu yes. Yeah, uh, my question is for uh, Ahmed Shanti. Uh, you pointed out that the economic uh, marginalization of the African community in Saudi Arabia began with the uh, emergence of the Assyrian regime. On the other hand, you pointed out that the African uh, Muslim scholars there were, in fact, defending the Saudi regime. How do you reconcile these two uh, positions? The fact that on the one hand, the African community has been marginalized by this regime. But on the other hand, the Muslim scholars from that community are defending the regime from criticism. Is, it, is that due to the fact that these African scholars are beholden economically uh, to the patronage of the South uh, Oh, We have one, one final question. Yeah, this, 
respond to that one quickly. That's it. Um, yeah, I, I wrote about that um, in the paper a little bit, and uh, I had actually asked the question of the, arguably the, the, the kind of leading Sheikh of the Tijaniya in, in the world today, Sheikh Tijan Sisi, and he said the same way that Allah can speak to the Prophet directly, but out of adab or out of kindness to the Prophet, he will send the angel Jibreel to, as an intermediary, um, the same way that the Prophet out of um, respect and kindness to Shaykh Ahmed Jani for uh, usually mundane affairs will, um, will conduct uh, conversations through his, uh, his disciple. Um, and then uh, Ahmed Sukairaj also writes about uh, a similar explanation, basically suggesting that this was the common practice of the greatest afrad, um, the, the unique ones of the Mohammedan community out of adab with the Prophet, that they don't ask him things directly sometimes. Yeah. There's also precedent in the Sira for this, like the example, the call to prayer was a mm -hmm. dream that was given to a companion, mm -hmm. not directly given to. Uh, interesting mm -hmm. point. All right. Okay. Uh, uh, concerning the, 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 the question of uh, uh, the Sufi belonging huh, to the Shanakhita, uh, the uh, uh, scholar you have mentioned who wrote a pamphlet, Gigan Tijani, uh, he, was not, uh, uh, he was not a Salafi, but he was also Sufi. Mm -hmm. He was Qadiri. Mm -hmm. So the Shanakhita, the ulama Shanakhita, are uh, mostly Qadiri, so Sufi. Uh, to relating to uh, Al Jami and as uh, someone who are above, and the people of Sharim Mansur in the ghetto, I think uh, it's it's also the question of identity. Al Jami identify himself as a Saudi, uh, Saudi Salafi. Uh, so it was his identity, and. Uh, uh, likewise, uh, the other guy, uh, Sobban, he was Saudi. Uh, he identified himself, and he wrote that in his, one of his books. Uh, he precised that he has a dark skin, uh, big, uh, big, uh, a big, uh, big man, but uh, uh, he has nothing to do with Africa. Uh, he, he was born in Saudi from slave ancestor, and he identified himself as a Saudi and Arab. So uh, the same thing with uh, someone who, who, with the name Al Kalbani. Mm -hmm. Al Kalbani was uh, he is a Salafi alim, was uh, the first uh, black alim. Uh, nominated as imam in the uh, Masjid al-Haram in Mecca. And when he was named, he, he said, I'm the black uh, Obama of, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, of, uh, of Saudi Arabia. And then he had the problem with the, uh, one of the uh, royal family, a discussion, a conflict. So uh, he uh, uh, was obliged to resign and he went back to his mosque in Riyadh. So I met him in Riyadh, and uh, I told him I come because I'm working on a project of uh, uh, African ulama in Saudi, and he said, I'm not African. <laughs> I'm black, but I'm not African. Ah. So he's very tough, huh? <laughs> so, uh, I'm black, I'm Saudi, black, but not African. So, uh, but uh, then he accepted to discuss with me. So to come to this question of identity, it's a big question. So uh, my mother don't identi doesn't identify herself as African. So uh, the name Africa, it comes from Comoro. African because it's, a, it's a something new of our modern Africa. But uh, my parents, my grandparents, they identify themselves as Comorian, but African, it's my, <laughs> my identification. It's, it's, it's a question of generation. So. Any other responses from the panelists? Would you like to respond to Kai's question? To Kai, yeah, I find it's a, it's a, it's a very uh, fascinating idea. I, 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 will, I follow this idea. 
uh, to see uh, the link between those who were above and those who still marginalized. What was the link between them? It's a, it's a tough question. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending the panel. Um, Hope we can continue can this. Can I just quickly oh, I'm respond sorry. to, yeah, sorry to, to cut Kai? You off. Um, Kai, thanks for your question. Um, if I understand it correctly, you're asking me what is the relationship between the different kinds of sources that I'm using and how do they fit into the broader sort of picture. Um, the, the paper is drawn from a dissertation chapter on al-Azhar and the orders of knowledge, and that's now being worked into a book manuscript. Um, but it also forms the basis of a critical introduction to um, a, a translation and edited edition of Dur al-Manzum that I'm, I'm working on right now. And what I'd like to do in that precisely, and here I take a lot of uh, inspiration from La Capra and, and people who do critical kind of historiography, is to think about our sources in a completely different way, to think about the different functions that the same source can can actually play. Um, and so I read actually a biographical dictionary not as a repository of historical data or an archive, but as an authored rhetorical composition. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I quote from it extensively. So, Thank you very much to our panelists, and thank you all. Hope to continue these conversations later.